termites have the ability to use it and recycle it and turn it back into the bush as nutrients and in, in doing so they actually improve the environment. Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of Shimori TV. So this is what I want to speak to you about today. Well, not a, not a dry, dead piece of wood, but actually what breaks it down. I want to talk about these guys over here, termites. Now we've spoken about elephants before and how they're engineers of the bush, such an important keystone species. But termites are just as important. They are immensely important for the recycling of this material in the bush. Without termites, there would be a massive buildup of dry moribund material from grass, from trees, from elephant dung. Anything that contains dry lignified cellulose wouldn't be able to be broken down and digested by most other animals and it would just accumulate. Where termites have the ability to use it and recycle it and turn it back into the bush as nutrients and in, in doing so, they actually improve the environment. Let's have a look at these guys. So one of the most common species of termites on Shomwari Private Game Reserve is these guys over here, the snouted harvester termites. Now the snouted harvester termites are called that for two reasons. Number one, they're harvesting termites. In other words, they go out and gather stuff, they harvest. So there's two different types of termites that you get. Some of them are mandibulate, in other words, they've got very big pincers and are able to defend the colony by biting. And then you get these guys over here that are nasute. They've got basically like a water pistol on top of their head that can spray a noxious chemical at whatever attacker is attacking the colony and in so doing uh, deter the predators. So I think a very interesting thing about termites is these guys are actually now classed as a super organism. And what that means is a termite cannot survive by itself. And a type or caste member of a termite can't survive without other members of the caste system either. And what I mean by that is each member, the millions and millions of members inside this colony, each have a specific role and job to do their entire lives. In other words, a worker will only work. He will be responsible, or she, for building the mound, the colony, the, the, the nest that we can see over here. They will be responsible for building and construction, as well as foraging. Then you get soldiers, the nazut soldiers of this type of termite. They will never work, but they will be responsible only and solely for defending the colony. And then you get the queen and the king. They're the only reproductive members within here that are mating regularly and laying eggs in order to increase numbers of the colony. In fact, the queen who lives for 20 to 30 years can be laying up to 20,000 eggs per day. That's a massive, massive amount. Then there's another group within a termite colony called the alates. They're the winged reproductives. So right as the rainy season arrives and conditions are ideal and favorable, there'll be a mass exodus of these what are commonly known as flying ants, but they're not ants. We'll talk about that just now. These are known as the winged alates, the future reproductive kings and queens of new colonies. They'll fly out and whenever they land on the ground, a female will release a very specific pheromone. It'll attract a male. He will join onto her, they will both shed their wings, and they will only mate if they have flown. They will then tunnel down, seal themselves into a little area, mate, lay eggs, and the first generation of offspring they will look after. Once those little termites reach a certain age, they will start looking after the king and queen, and that's the last work they will do. Every single egg that will ever hatch from then onwards, whether it be a worker or a soldier, is solely responsible for looking after the colony and the king and queen. Then the alates will go off when conditions are favorable again and the whole cycle starts over again. So here you can see there's a few soldiers that have come out to a little opening over here. Whenever there's an inrush of fresh air, they absolutely hate it uh, if it's not supposed to be there and they'll come rushing out. Now each one of these little soldiers over here you can see has a little point to the front of his head. They have a big bulbous orange head with a little point. And that's basically like a water pistol. And if I put my finger here, it's not sore. They don't bite me at all. 
but each one of those little soldiers is spraying me with a minute amount of that sticky substance and I love the smell of it. Those terpenoids to me smell almost like a, a, a lychee fruit. Um, but it is a very toxic chemical to a lot of animals, uh, even things like bat-eared foxes and that actually can't eat uh, a lot of these termites. Uh, things like an aardwolf, they can, they can sustain uh, the chemicals and you can actually smell that in their fecal material. But one aardwolf can eat about 300,000 termites per night. So one common misconception is termites are often referred to as white ants. But termites aren't related to ants at all. Ants are in a completely different order. In fact, termites are more closely related to cockroaches than they are to ants. And indeed, they're grouped together under the order bladder deer, whereas ants are under hymenoptera. As I was saying earlier, one of the most important ecological factors about termites is their ability to decompose dry grass or wood matter. Uh, it's essentially uh, a, a component in the environment that nothing can digest. But even termites don't really have the ability to truly digest cellulose. What I mean by that is these termites go out and forage for grass and twigs and bring it down and indeed they do ingest it. But it's special protozoa and bacteria in their gut that actually assist with the breaking down of that material. And the byproduct of that then is their food. Another group of termites are probably the most successful farmers, if you were to look at it from that point of view, ever. They farm with fungus. These termites have the ability to plant spore gardens on their chewed up carton or nests underground. The fungus then grows off of that and they feed off of that as their food source. So they don't even have the ability to digest the cellulose. But nonetheless, it's probably some of the most intricate and amazing relationships set up in nature and definitely uh, one can't survive without the other. Not all termites have above ground colonies, nests that you can see. This species of termites does. The only way you'll notice it in an area is by these big mounds of earth, these big dome shaped mounds. They start off really tiny and as the colony grows and more and more workers are working, so the mound will grow and grow. And if you have one queen that is living for 20, 30 years, that mound will grow substantially over time. If that queen dies out, she can be replaced by a secondary queen she will be less productive than the first and eventually the colony may die out and you will find these mounds that are decomposing and all of that frass material, semi-decomposed material uh, and all the aerated soil that starts returning back into the environment just takes a huge amount of nitrates and calcium and nitrogen and everything into the soil and improves the quality around it. If another alate couple lands in that colony, they can reinvigorate it and it'll get taken over. And indeed, you can find some termite mounds that have been going for centuries. I think one of the most amazing things about termites, and these in particular, and indeed some of the termite mounds that grow to 14 meters tall, those termites are blind, yet they build such amazing architectural wonders and indeed probably the most energy efficient structures ever created. Humans are now starting to design buildings, energy efficient, carbon neutral buildings designed around termite mounds because these guys have figured out the most efficient way of controlling temperature. It doesn't matter if it's 40 degrees outside in the sun or minus four degrees on a cold winter's day. Inside that termite mound, it will be a constant temperature and only fluctuate at the extremes over maybe one or two degrees. Termites do this by following simple laws of physics. In other words, hot air will always rise, cold air will always sink. Massive numbers of animals together, all respiring at the same time, generate heat. Now these guys are in a closed environment all the time and really sensitive to fluctuating temperatures. They have to keep the temperature inside the mound at a constant. Humidity is important for making sure that the eggs don't grow mold or desiccate and dry out, otherwise they won't hatch and there will be a deficit of workers or soldiers in the colony. They do this by opening and closing vents all around the colony. And as hot air rises out, so on the ground level you have other vents and that cold air is drawn underground and so it circulates through the colony and cools them down. A lot of your species of termites have the ability to burrow all the way down to the water table and each little worker gathers one little drop of water and brings it up and places it at different parts of the colony, whether it be on the fungus gardens and act actively water them or around on different parts of the nest to cause evaporation and in do so it cools them down as well. 
but the termites have the ability to open and close vents in order to control temperature. And for animals that can't see, that is amazing. So the termite mound that we're seeing above ground is a very small percentage of the mound. Most of this colony is subterranean. They underground, deep, deep underground. About two thirds or just over two thirds of the mass of this mound is underground, not above ground. This is a part of a destroyed termite mound. Often you'll have rhino rubbing against termite mounds. You can see this is just the right height for an elephant or a rhino to have a wonderful scratch on. And it's incredibly, incredibly hard, but you can imagine a few ton animal busy rubbing on here, they will break it. So I don't want to break this open, but I'll show you this. And we can have a look at the structure of all of these interconnected chambers and colonies. And this honeycomb structure is just so, so strong, uh, but made up of regurgitated uh, and chewed wood and fecal material, and it is very, very strong. So another very common species of termite on Shamwari Private Game Reserve is these guys over here, the harvester termites. Now, What's interesting about these guys is, well, number one, it's daytime and they're out busy foraging. But if you look at these guys, they actually contain a pigment, they dark in coloration. And that pigment allows them to actually forage during the daytime out in the sun, where all other termites are forced to be underground away from sunlight. That gives them a big advantage. In wintertime when it's cold, it allows them to forage during the daytime. Sometimes in summertime when it's hot, they'll forage early morning and uh, late afternoon when it cools down. And in summertime, uh, they'll forage at nighttime. Now you can see over here, this is a telltale sign that we are looking at uh, these harvester termites. All of this grass has been cut or harvested and they're now pulling it towards a little entrance hole over here. And you can see these little workers over here, they've cut all of the uh, dry grass and twigs, whatever they can gather. There's even a couple of leaves going down there. They've harvested it together and now they're pulling it down underground um, and that's the other interesting thing about these termites is unless you see one of these feeding ports or a cleaning port, which I'll show you just now, you actually won't know that they're here. So these nests are subterranean. You can't see them. Deep underground, sometimes as deep as six meters down, you will find these harvester termites nesting in what are known as cartons. They're big, round, almost like a, a brain looking uh, layered uh, carton. It's made up of fecal material, chewed up grass, all of that type of stuff. And that's their stores where they'll, where they'll store this chewed up grass, uh, twigs and other bits of uh, cellulose. Not only are these guys found quite deep, but extensively the range of one colony of termites can be over one kilometer in length. That is astounding. And this colony comprises of hundreds of thousands of individuals, each little one able to cut and carry grass. It's only the workers that will be harvesting grass and twigs and taking it down. They have eyes, which is another oddity in the termite world. Most termites can't see, they're blind. Whereas these guys have the ability to forage in daylight, out in the sun, and they have eyes. If we disturb these guys just a little bit, all of a sudden, there's a massive amount of communication that gets sent down there. Your soldiers will come out, and we can see one here, as we touch there over there, they start knocking their heads. And that knocking of the heads is actually a, a signal to the rest of the colony that they might be under attack. And what'll happen is the workers start uh, not working anymore. They'll start taking a back seat, uh, heading underground, and the soldiers will start becoming active. They'll start blocking the pathways. They'll block the entrance with their heads, whilst a whole bunch of workers will start sealing up the entrance to prevent any predators from coming in there. So although this doesn't look like much, this is another telltale sign that we are looking at harvester termites. And I'll show you what I mean by that. There's this little mound of sand over here and we can tell it's from termites because it's in a little mound and a heap. And we just move a little bit of the sand away from the edges. What we will find are chimneys. And what we mean by chimneys is basically the ability for these termites to throw a whole bunch of rubbish out of the colony. So there's one of the chimneys over there. And this allows the termites to walk up and throw 
all of the rubbish from the inside of the colony, their housekeeping, throwing it out of the colony onto the surface of the ground. And the more they throw out, the higher the mound gets, the higher they need to build this chimney so that it's allowing them to work in a protected environment and get rid of all of the waste material out of their colony. And you can imagine just how nutrient rich this ground is. It's all basically sand pellets from digging their tunnels and fresh material. Uh, basically the, the waste products from the termites. And there'll be a little bit of exoskeletons in that in here as well sometimes that you'll find. So this is a cleaning port, the area that they'll clean out all of the waste material from their colony. And what we were looking at earlier was a feeding port where they will take food down into the colony. So here's a perfect example of the protective covering that the harvester termites have made at nighttime so that they can come and spend time in safety and slowly chip away at the bits of wood that they are able to take away and digest. Now, this is really important because as these animals move out into an environment and are harvesting, you can just imagine the volume of grass and cuttings and wood that they're taking down below. So it is such an important part of the ecosystem. And I know that when you think or hear the word termites, you, you associate it with damaging houses and that type of stuff. And yes, in, uh, in urban environments, they can be very, very damaging. Uh, but out here in nature, they are so, so important to the overall functioning of the ecosystem. We cannot do without them. Well, we've just scratched the surface today. There is still so much more to talk about, and we'll probably cover that on a future episode. So I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to give it a like, give it a thumbs up, and we'll hopefully see you soon. Until then, be safe.